Good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear delegates of the European Youth Parliament, dear participants, and also a warm welcome to our viewers online. I'm so happy to see so many of you here uh, for our discussion this evening, uh, which is on the topic of uh, transportation in Europe and Rail Baltica, which is uh, currently one of the major um, rail, railway transport infrastructure projects of the North Sea Baltic uh, corridor of the TENT network. So um, today um, we will uh, structure this, uh, the discussion as follows. We will have um, first uh, a small presentation, uh, introduction uh, by Mr. Zaune, uh, who is uh, a board member of one of the implementing bodies of the Rail Baltica project uh, to introduce you uh, about uh, this project, and uh, then we will move into a discussion about the uh, railways um, uh, sector uh, challenges uh, and uh, solutions that it faces in the context of uh, the Green Deal and uh, the developments uh, in the European transport network. Um, after that, uh, we will uh, have also a small um, uh, story from um, uh, a, a traveler's experience uh, of traveling in Europe and uh, the second part of the discussion will have a broader spectrum about um, uh, the transport system more generally, not so much focused on rail, but considering also different modes of transport. So uh, we will start uh, this evening uh, with a nice uh, warm video greeting that we have received from the former European Commissioner for Transport, uh, Ms. Violeta Bulch. Dear European Youth Parliament, delegates, organizers, hosts, respectful guests, it is a great pleasure and honor to address you at the 96th International Session of the European Youth Parliament in Riga, Latvia. Latvian Presidency of the EU was my first in the capacity of the EU Commissioner for Transport, and I still hold the very fond memories of all the events and negotiations that we did together. The country's rich history, culture, and important strategic position make Riga a perfect place for your meeting, focusing also on transport. Transport is indeed an important strategic tool for successful development of democracy. If transport stops, everything stops. And every time transport has a hiccup, economy has it as well. If there is a lack of transport connectivity, member states cannot maximize their capacities for progress and the creation of added value. Transport connects people, enables them to engage, collaborate, co-create, and jointly deliver the future they want to live. Baltic states in particular understand how important it is to be well connected with the rest of the EU and to fully bear fruits of its membership. COVID crisis, Brexit, and the latest war in Ukraine are challenging us even more to understand the system solutions, the advantages of good connectivity and smooth cross-border services. When I say good transport, I mean modern, standardized, physical infrastructure, digitally supported mobility as a service based on shared and collaborative business models, standardized digital documents that can flow independently of cargo and people and help in more efficient organization of the entire mobility network. When I say modern, I mean integrated ticketing for the point-to-point -point smooth travel experience or multimodal solutions with automated cargo manipulation and dispatchers. When I say good transport, I mean safe, secure, green, and nature-friendly transport, which is focused on people's genuine needs. Innovation, which is helping people and the planet to thrive. Transport was one of the weak points of Baltic states in relationship with the EU. So it is of no surprise that we jointly focus to overcome this weakness by supporting large-scale 
investments in transport infrastructure, capacity building and services. Baltic states were traditionally used to look east, so their transport connectivity with the west was weak. Rail Baltica, for example, is one of those strategically important projects that for the first time connects Baltic states with the EU single railway area by modern EU standards. Such standards, modern connectivity contribute also to a much more robust military mobility services, which we understand these days even more than in the past. Military mobility we see in the EU as a dual use, dual benefit investment shared between civilian and mobility stakeholders. Dear friends, we live in a very challenging times when each of us is tested based on the internal strength, empathy, solidarity, and capacity to see beyond the known. We are at the verge of big societal changes, and I hope that the love for humanity will prevail and we will jointly find the way forward towards sustainable, inclusive, responsible, and robust society based on circular economy and regenerative principles. There is no them, it is only us. And I'm inviting you to see that no idea is too big to be shared and no step too small to be taken. So go boldly on the wings of connectivity and be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you. So some very encouraging words there from the former commissioner. And uh, I, I am personally very glad to hear she mentioned the Latvian uh, presidency period. I had the honor to accompany her on some of her visits and to witness it. And I could really feel the enthusiasm. And uh, it was uh, always uh, such a pleasure um, working with her. So um, right now, um, uh, just to slightly introduce uh, in some more detail uh, the topic. Um, uh, as you might uh, be aware, um, the European Commission has uh, recently uh, uh, published and uh, set uh, some very ambitious targets uh, for the Europe, uh, European Union. Uh, and uh, the aim is, for example, one of the many aims uh, is to reduce uh, significantly the um, greenhouse gas emissions of the transport sector. So the transport sector accounts for around one quarter of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. Um, road transport is about 20%. Uh, and um, the, the aim is to um, reduce this by 90% uh, by uh, 2050. And already by uh, 2030, by uh, uh, 55%. So. Um, Today, I would like that we uh, discuss and brainstorm together how to achieve this and uh, uh, to really to make it a reality. And uh, um, to start then, um, uh, just, yeah, to start a little bit uh, more lightly, uh, we will also have a small uh, Slido question um, to um, test um, because you will be able to ask questions on Slido throughout the event. Uh, the hashtag is um, EYP Rail Baltica. So I would like you to open your um, uh, your uh, explorer and uh, go to slido.com. Hashtag EYP Rail Baltica. And uh, we will have two questions there just to um, understand a little better uh, who is uh, here in the audience, uh, so just uh, tell us which country are you from. And uh, in the meantime, I would uh, also like to introduce everybody with our uh, distinguished panelists of tonight. Uh, starting on my right, uh, it is Mr. Ivar Sijaps, who is a member of the European Parliament, also a member of uh, the ITRE Committee, um, Com Committee on uh, Industry, Research and Energy. Uh, we have uh, Sarah Bit uh, Bittner, who is... Um, 
the uh, communications manager at the international office of the European Youth Parliament, uh, which is also under the umbrella of um, the Schwarzkopf um, Foundation uh, for, for Youth. And um, I'm also happy to introduce Carlos Bumesters, who is a political advisor at the European Parliament. Uh, he works uh, in the office of Vice President Robert Ziele, uh, who is also highly engaged uh, in the work of the Transport Committee at the European Parliament. And uh, here we have also Mr. Artur Zaune, uh, who, as I mentioned, is uh, the management board member of uh, one of the implementing bodies of the Rail Baltic project. So uh, right now I'm looking at Slido and, wow, uh, uh, some interesting uh, responses here. So we have uh, the Netherlands, uh, uh, very widely represented. Uh, also, of course, Latvians, Norwegians, Swiss. Um, so very, very uh, interesting um, uh, audience. So, Sarah, um, I would maybe ask you as, um, uh, as uh, one of the participants of the European Youth uh, um, Parliament, uh, if you can tell us a little bit, uh, especially for the online viewers uh, who might not be so familiar, um, tell us just briefly, what is the European Youth Parliament and uh, who are the main uh, member organizations and uh, how many participants in the organization? Thank you very much. So the European Youth Parliament is one of the largest European youth networks bringing together young people to discuss and debate the pressing issues of our time. We are represented in around 40 countries and annually around 30,000 young people take part in our events at the international, regional, national and local levels. Today we are in Riga at our flagship event the 96th International Session of the European Youth Parliament, hosted and organized by the European Youth Parliament Latvia, our national member organization. Thank you, Sarah. So um, right now, uh, we also have opened the second question on Slido, and I'm uh, glad to see that uh, the answers are already flowing in. Uh, so the question is, have you traveled before on high-speed uh, rail? Uh, so, well, for some, this question uh, might be uh, quite like the answer might be obvious, uh, and for them, it might be, you know, part of uh, their uh, daily uh, kind of commuting since the childhood, especially here in the Baltic states. Uh, we don't have a real high-speed connections for now. So, uh, you can see that 27% uh, of the... Uh, uh, audience uh, have, have never even experienced uh, what, it, what it is like, what the high-speed trains uh, feel and look like. Uh, and uh, we are uh, very much, uh, all the Baltic people um, know how much we are looking forward uh, to Rail Baltica to be impl implemented in the uh, near future. It will be uh, 780 uh, kilometers, uh, sorry, 870 kilometers of uh, double track high speed rail infrastructure. So the project is now um, uh, in um, already some first construction works have started, whilst uh, still uh, the majority of the main line is in advanced design uh, stage. And uh, I now would like to invite Artur Zaune to present it in uh, much more detail. Uh, to acquaint you with this. Thank you. Welcome to Riga. Welcome to the perfect place. I'm uh, proud to greet you here uh, in Riga, uh, in, in uh, one of the future uh, nodes of the TNT, Transport, Euro uh, um, uh, Transport of European uh, um, network nodes in the Baltics and I will tell you a little bit the story of the project of the century uh, we are currently implementing uh, in the Baltics. Um, Real Baltica is uh, part of something bigger, uh, it is part of the uh, TNT core network and in particular the North Sea Baltic uh, 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 core network corridor uh, connecting uh, many places uh, uh, around the Baltic Sea and uh, uh, 
and the rest uh, of, uh, of the Europe. Uh, we are also the missing link. Uh, uh, the Rebaltica does not exist yet. Uh, we are about to create uh, a new economic corridor, and I would like to tell that this is not just a railway. It is uh, much more than a railway. We see uh, uh, that uh, Rebaltica will bring uh, to the Baltics and uh, overall to the region uh, the economic boost uh, with many, many opportunities. Um, regarding the implementation structure, uh, Signe uh, told, I'm representing one of the organizations. So the red boxes are where I'm working. However, Signe is working in the very central place and uh, RB Rail is the joint venture of uh, all three Baltic countries uh, uh, to uh, develop and implement Rail Baltica. And uh, my company is the Latvian company uh, being a shareholder for the uh, joint venture and uh, in the same time also responsible uh, for implementation of uh, uh, Rail Baltica and we share the responsibilities between the countries and between the uh, companies. So the structure is quite, uh, 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 quite difficult actually to explain, uh, but uh, uh, this is, I would say, that a common thing uh, for uh, mega projects where you cannot find a very easy solution. It is all about uh, uh, um, different situations in different countries. It is all about uh, uh, looking consensus uh, for a common vision. But what's important, we want to deliver a single railway system. What does it mean? It means uh, that uh, uh, there will be no national networks in the meaning uh, uh, of what is uh, traditionally uh, uh, across uh, the Europe. Uh, the trains will be able to run smoothly from Tallinn to, to Riga, uh, via Kaunas uh, to Warsaw and elsewhere in, uh, in the Europe. And uh, this is our uh, biggest challenge as we have to make the project uh, across three countries, actually five. Uh, also, Poland is very much involved uh, in delivering Rail Baltica as we are connecting Rail Baltica to the Polish railway network. And uh, the fifth country is Finland. We see in the long-term vision also the uh, uh, connection, the connectivity towards Helsinki and further north. Uh, what is important when I'm telling this, this is a little bit uh, the story how the kitchen works. Uh, but for us, uh, while implementing the project, uh, it is important to look at the user's perspective and uh, uh, to, uh, mm, to make it easy for the user. This is why we say single entry point for the railway undertakings, so the ones who will transport passengers and transport uh, freight. Uh, for the mobility, uh, uh, there is a new strategy uh, of EU since uh, 2020, but actually we started the Robaltica already quite years ago. So the routes of Robaltica are uh, uh, already uh, defined in 1994 with the first uh, ideas and agreements, the so-called Tallinn Declaration of the Special Planners uh, across the Baltic Sea. and. Uh, uh, we think we are uh, uh, responding to the uh, EU uh, Green Smart uh, Sustainable Mobility Strategy very well. Um, we will be able to uh, deliver the resilient infrastructure in the meaning uh, resilience towards the climate change, but not, also, uh, not only, uh, also uh, overall uh, improving uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Baltic uh, transport system uh, uh, reliability and improving the capacity. This is, this is about the fluidity uh, and uh, connectivity. Of course, in everyday life, what we are doing, it is uh, 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 planning, designing, and constructing a railway. It's all about the rails, the money, uh, to enable the trains run at certain time. But what's important, again, user's perspective, it's so that the railway system becomes performant and delivers the time necessary for 
uh, us uh, uh, for our mobility needs, needs and uh, for the uh, freight transportation needs. But in the same time, of course, we care about the environment and sustainability, and this is why we are uh, building uh, the railway system, delivering the railway, uh, uh, enabling uh, the Baltic, and overall also the European transport system becoming much greener. Um, uh, nice words, uh, but uh, how it looks in the practice, how we are responding uh, uh, to, uh, to the strategy, it's uh, all about some, let's say, key numbers and key abbreviations. 249 means uh, this is the speed we want uh, uh, to, uh, 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 the trains to run uh, on the line. Um, why only 249, someone would ask? Uh, we think this is uh, a good response to the needs in the region, but also we have to remember that uh, the high-speed trains will be not the only ones running on the line. We will have also the regional traffic and uh, the freight traffic. So 200 uh, kilometers per hour is that what we think is a competitive uh, service uh, for the regional travelers, meaning the commuters uh, commuting uh, uh, to and from uh, Tallinn or Riga or Kaunas or Vilnius. And uh, for the freight transportation, then the competitive speed would be 120. Then on the slides you see uh, some abbreviations, ETCS L2, FRMCS uh, means ERTMS. So this is uh, all about the digitalization, it is all about the safety and the newest technologies. ETCS means European Train Control System, Level 2 means that on the Rail Baltica, uh, contrary to the railway system we can see here in the Baltics, we will have no line-side line signals. Uh, we will be able to manage all the uh, train uh, traffic control di digitally via ra radio communication system, and this is why we have uh, then the next abbreviation, FRMCS, which means Future Radio Mobile Communication System. So, uh, in other words, I also wanted to invite you to study the, uh, the uh, engineering sciences and uh, we will have uh, uh, for sure uh, many, many jobs available in the future uh, for the engineers and digital uh, uh, professionals. Altogether, in the sum, ERTMS means European Rail Traffic Management System, and this is what Mrs. Violetta Boltz said about the standardization. Uh, this is the common standard uh, across the U Europe, and uh, every European uh, member state is committed uh, to implement this system by a certain timeline. In the Baltics, first we are contributing uh, by Rail Baltica, and now also we have started some discussions how to implement uh, the ERTMS system also across the existing railway systems. 25 kV AC means we are going electric. So uh, the uh, current uh, will be 25 kilovolts, and uh, it, it would mean that we bring again uh, uh, the environmental sustainability that all the trains will be able to run on electricity. And we would prefer, of course, that uh, every train is uh, using just a green energy. And this, uh, this will mean uh, we will have also then uh, uh, to incentivize that uh, the train operators, the railway undertakings are using the green energy for the attraction. Um, about the time. Currently, if you uh, would like to go from Riga to Tallinn or to Vilnius, and this in particular is the case Riga to Tallinn, you will need uh, by bus or by car uh, around uh, four hours and 30 minutes, uh, sometimes a little bit less, uh, uh, in the congested times uh, maybe more, uh, uh, but what we want is that we are under the two hours, and uh, the two hours would bring the magic of the integration of the Baltic uh, in, uh, in many, many, many dimensions. And it is not about uh, just the traveling, it is also using the travel time in a productive way. On the impacts, 
the ones uh, uh, you, uh, who want uh, to read in more details, they are reflected in the Robotica cost-benefit analysis, but uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a few words, uh, I would say that what we want is first to increase the safety overall in the trans transport sector. Robotica will help to decrease the uh, accidents on the road, road infrastructure, meaning making also the road infrastructure safer. Per se, we assume Robotica will be safe as the railways are one of the safest transport modes. Uh, we are contributing also to the climate change to the, by the reduction of the CO2 emissions. Again, uh, how? By moving uh, the freight and the passengers from the road to the uh, railway. And uh, uh, how we incentivize this is by the time, uh, I explained in the previous slide, and uh, uh, also by the reliability for the freight and speed of the freight uh, delivery, uh, which would improve the supply chain improvements. Also, uh, um, any shift from the road to uh, 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 railway would, uh, would generate air pollution reduction as we will have uh, less emissions on the road transport and uh, will run on zero emissions uh, in the railway transport. Last but not least, also noise will decrease. Uh, perhaps this is uh, uh, the uh, least important point what we see in our citizens when they respond uh, to, uh, uh, to our intention to, to, to build the railway line, but I think this is also important to live in the world where uh, uh, the noise pollution is uh, the least possible. Overall, uh, Rabaltica is about the multimodality, and multimodality means that every transport mode is in the right way, the right place, in the right combination. So, this was my uh, Rabaltica story for today. I hope then during the sessions we will have uh, a few, uh, few more topics uh, to discuss, and uh, I'm sure you will have some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arturs. And uh, I would like to remind uh, everyone watching online as well as here that um, uh, we are happy to take questions. Uh, so first we will uh, tackle the questions more specifically on Rail Baltica and uh, the other ones that I see are already flowing in uh, that are more general, uh, we will respond in the, during the course of the discussion. Uh, so, um, Arturs, uh, we have uh, one question here um, which uh, reads as follows. It's uh, from um, uh, Karol uh, Hodur uh, from Poland. Uh, so the Rail Baltica line ends in Poland. Uh, which is also massively investing in high-speed rail as part of their central hub airport. Are you uh, cooperating with this project? So I can also uh, help you. <laughs> I can answer it very short, of course. Exactly. I can elaborate a little bit further. Uh, we are uh, uh, in, in close contact with the Solidarity Transport Hub in Poland. Uh, so uh, we, we have uh, mutual visits and uh, um, kind of best practice practice experience exchanges. Uh, our colleagues have gone to Poland and uh, Polish colleagues are visiting us. And uh, of course also with the uh, PKP, which is the Polish infrastructure manager and uh, also the Polish Ministry of Transport uh, is uh, represented on um, uh, the so-called uh, Rail Baltica Task Force, uh, which uh, meets at least twice per year. Uh, it is uh, chaired by um, the uh, co kind of corridor coordinator, Miss Catherine Troutman. So the European Transport, um, sorry, the European uh, tra Trans-European Transport Network is divided into several corridors, and Rail Baltica falls on this uh, North Sea Baltic corridor. And uh, we have uh, regular meetings in this whole corridor format, which uh, involves also uh, uh, ministry representatives and infrastructure managers uh, on, on the whole network, uh, also including Dutch, uh, German uh, colleagues. And the Rail Baltic Task Force uh, specifically has um, uh, the, the, the ministries of the Baltic States and Poland. So uh, please, please be active uh, also here in the audience if you would like to know uh, something more about uh, the Rail Baltica project and, and uh, have some questions, just raise your hand. And uh, please, we have one question over there. Yeah. Um, so 
Just uh, wait for the microphone for a second. Thanks. So uh, my question is, I guess, greenwashing is a massive issue in today's society. And as young people, we're very concerned about the climate crisis um, and environmental issues. So I guess perhaps could we get some clarification around carbon emissions surrounding the construction of this rail line, as well as the construction of new trains, um, as well as can Rail Baltica guarantee that the electricity powering these trains will come from renewable resources because currently high-speed trains are still contributing to carbon emissions um, as electricity is primarily still generated by fossil fuels. Uh, maybe I will. Sure. I, yes, uh, Arthur, so I, I will let you start and we can. Yeah, uh, uh, just uh, uh, then I will start uh, from the, the last uh, uh, point on, uh, let's say, on ensuring that the railway undertakings are using uh, the green energy. Uh, what we can do is to incentivize uh, uh, this action. Uh, there is an energy market uh, which is free, and this means also that the railway undertakings uh, uh, making their services on the line uh, uh, will have, of course, the right to choose. What we would like to see is, of course, that they are using the green energy. Currently, uh, we have started also uh, to elaborate, uh, let's say, the network access policy and truck access charging uh, policy, which means that uh, here is again uh, a certain framework set uh, so far uh, uh, again uh, on the European level, what uh, is uh, uh, possible uh, to do for the railway infrastructure managers to incentivize or uh, to uh, prohibit, but first of all, we will have all the uh, uh, all the preconditions met, so the entire line will be electrified. Uh, the, there will be, uh, of course, the access uh, to the uh, uh, the energy on the energy market, and uh, what we can do is really to incentivize. Uh, the uh, the first question about the capturing the uh, the carbon during the construction side, uh, we uh, we have looked, and of course uh, we are looking. Uh, in, in the design stage uh, uh, on the, uh, let's say, sustainable design aspects, uh, so also looking for the uh, local material use as much as possible, but of course the Baltics are not the, the ones uh, who have, uh, for example, the, 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 the steel, yeah? so uh, that, that's the natural that we'll have to, to, to import. Uh, but again, uh, uh, we want to focus uh, 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 in, uh, in the operational face uh, as uh, much as possible uh, towards the uh, green and sustainable, making as less emissions possible, as uh, uh, less emissions as, as, as is pos uh, technically possible. Um, I could also add that, of course, for the construction, uh, we have uh, a very uh, strict and clear requirements uh, for, for the construction uh, companies uh, that we employ for the potential suppliers uh, with various uh, minimal uh, criteria they have to meet uh, that consider uh, in, in depth also the environmental aspects. And um, there is also um, climate proofing guidance uh, that was recently published by the European Commission, which uh, all the um, uh, transport uh, projects uh, in, in Europe have to comply with. Uh, so we are <laughs> trying to do our uh, best that we can uh, in this regard. And then um, any more questions here from the audience? If not, uh, we have one more from Slido. Uh, so from Slido, um, we have a general question about um, how do you see the impact of this project, uh, project on people's lives in the Baltic states and uh, the connection between the different Baltic states and the people? Um, I tried to answer it in, uh, let's say, with a, a small example, but this is all about the quality of life. Um, so for the uh, commuters uh, in the corridors where El Baltica will uh, uh, provide the opportunities uh, for commuting uh, in much sustainable way than it's today. It is uh, uh, run uh, on, on the north-south axis. It will bring, of course, the less uh, trucks on the roads. Uh, it will bring also the less uh, passenger cars, as, the, as there will be very good uh, and competitive uh, uh, 
service offer uh, uh, for uh, for the multimodal trip. Uh, um, so the la first mile, last mile, of course, will be uh, then enabled by any uh, means of transport, starting from walking uh, to cycling. Uh, and uh, as well, we are uh, planning uh, how to make uh, uh, very good integration with the current uh, uh, public transport network and uh, working uh, uh, also in some working groups, uh, creating, as an example here for Latvia, also the integrated uh, uh, public transport network, uh, uh, let's say around the Riga metro area, but uh, as well uh, looking uh, on uh, very good connections in uh, in, uh, in 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 Latvian uh, dimension but also considering the Baltic dimension okay yes we have some more questions please um, the microphone uh, thank you I asked the question on slide over I'll just say it in person. Um, why would someone choose to take a train which is slower and sometimes more expensive than low-cost flights, especially because with the current economical state of the world, cheap prices are often valued more than climate-friendly options? Thank you for the question. This is, I think, an excellent uh, kind of uh, move uh, to our next uh, topic, which is the challenges uh, that the railway sector faces. Uh, so why would someone choose a train if the flights are cheaper? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, in the Baltics, especially, we have very, let's say, very short, uh, let's say, short haul flights, and uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, Robotica would be very competitive if we uh, look on the services, like from uh, from door to door, because uh, 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 all the time you would spend uh, in the airport for check-in, for waiting, uh, uh, embarking, disembarking. Uh, uh, but, uh, having a, a, tra a train ride you would enjoy in, uh, let's say, in a much better environment and you would be able to be productive or you would be able to relax during, uh, uh, during this uh, trip. And uh, indeed we see uh, quite an uh, important shift then from, uh, from the uh, aviation to, to railways, so all all the major airports uh, in the Baltics are actually connected to Rail Baltica in some way. Uh, let's say the closest connection will be here in, in Riga, the Riga airport, uh, the ones who arrived by, uh, uh, um, by flying into the Riga airport, you could see that there are some construction works ongoing. This is uh, uh, then the future station for the Rail Baltica trains, but also in Tallinn and in Kaunas and in Vilnius, we will have uh, quite uh, good uh, multimodal solutions for very, very little uh, last mile uh, to be able to connect all the airports. Thank you very much. Before we really take the next questions, I would uh, like to involve and engage also our uh, other panelists. Uh, so uh, for this question, um, Mr. Ivar Sijaps, maybe you can comment. Uh, what are perhaps the discussions uh, in the European Parliament um, to, that um, uh, that would help uh, to make uh, travel by rail cheaper and more attractive? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And first of all, uh, welcome to you all to the University of Latvia, where I also work. I happen to be a professor, and this, by the way, this building itself is a very good example of how Europe helps development and how Europe tries to connect uh, the countries because uh, University of Latvia is getting increasingly internationalized, also because of this building, which was also partially funded by the so-called Junkers Foundation, I think something like five or, or seven years ago. But coming back to this very issue of um, Rail Baltica and its importance, which was uh, splendidly explained to you uh, by Mr. Zaune, First of all, uh, if you look at the map, you see that in many ways there are places in Europe which still need connection with the rest, or with the central part of the heartland, if you want, of, of Europe. And um, since Europe is built on those four freedoms, which you all know, the capital, 
goods, the labor, and the services. Movement is crucial, and interconnections are crucial. And this is what we are working upon in the European Parliament. Uh, in many ways, there are two programs uh, so called Trans-European Networks. They have two chapters. One is the transport part, and this is where the so-called TNT part of that, which is the part dealing with different kinds of transport corridors being developed. Another one is not less important. That was the TNE, which is on energy. But right now, we are dealing with transport. And in that sense, uh, well, uh, I think that Rail Baltica is also a success story, and also that my colleagues and myself, we have convinced the European Commission that this particular project is needed and is necessary. And that was mentioned already by um, distinguished former commissioner, uh, Madame Butch, uh, about uh, the necessity of this project for European purposes, because, well, we don't deny the fact that we are not uh, in the middle of Europe. We need uh, connections also because of our certain historical experiences which most countries have because also the, the width of our uh, railway trains is uh, much more aligned with the Russian standard than with the West European standard, which means that we need a new railway built in order to promote uh, all the things that have been mentioned. This is about passengers. This is about freight, but this is also what the Madam Commissioner mentioned very much about military mobility, and we don't deny that, because we know what's happening, let's say, a few hundred kilometers from here, and that's why this network is also needed. But as for the, uh, who, how to incentivize the people to use that, especially if uh, the flights are relatively cheap, the first thing is that they won't be so cheap in a few months or probably in a few years, because we all know that the, uh, I mean, I like traveling Ryanair to my whole, uh, to my um, Brussels office, and I usually do that, but we know that these prices are going up, not just because of uh, the fact that uh, the fuel prices are going up everywhere in the world, but also because of the, the Green Deal, because we are imposing certain limitations on, on how much uh, the flight companies can buy the cheap fuel and on what conditions, and we want to include also aviation in this um, uh, emission trading system and all the stuff, which means that, well, the, well, the, the time of uh, cheap flights is over, unfortunately. Uh, the second thing is that, well, there are already uh, quite a few things that have been mentioned by Mr. Zona in a sense that, uh, well, it's much more comfortable because uh, with those high-speed trains you can get into the city centers, and uh, which is much more difficult even in a city like Riga where the airport is located actually not far from the city center. But in many places it's much more difficult, uh, which means that this is really these times of, of checking security controls, disembarkings, embarkings, and so on and so forth and, and so on. Uh, but also the fact that, well, you can move much more freely in a railway car than you can in a flight. And the third thing is, well, this is much more what I am dealing with. This is about pricing policy and the state support for different kinds of transport. And since, well, you might say that there is cert still a certain carbon footprint of the Rail Baltica project, which is probably true, but at the same time, this carbon fruit footprint of the Rail Baltica is much smaller than different analogous uh, ways uh, of transport, uh, which are still using the fossil fuel. And in that sense, of course, well, uh, this is very much about state support. This is very much about smart pricing policies uh, in order to incentivize you all to use the uh, Real Baltica. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, still talking about the challenges that the. Oh, sorry, I have a mic. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, so I'm looking at Carlos still talking about the challenges that the railway sector uh, faces. Uh, so besides sort of the competition from other modes, uh, what in your view um, are some other major points? Um, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, good evening, everyone uh, here and, and, and abroad. Um, uh, although I have been invited here, as, uh, as, you, as you rightly mentioned, as a um, uh, uh, political advisor for, for, for one of the European Parliament uh, factions, uh, I'm also 35 years old, which means that basically I'm now living the last weeks and months as a, as a proper um, uh, member of European youth. So I really hope that, because I, wasn't it right? The 35 was the sort of the symbolic cutoff in the EU. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I hopefully can 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 speak uh, to, uh, today also as a, as a uh, active member of the European Youth. <laughs> um, uh, in that um, and in, in in that regard, and to be honest, I remember that working for the last uh, six or seven years in the European Parliament, uh, particularly with uh, with the current Vice President of the European Parliament, Mr. Robert Zeal, which 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 I think I regard as a as a main. Uh, let's say, protagonist <laughs> in the fight for uh, the Rail Baltic, uh, I don't know, since, since, since uh, late 90s, uh, still in his uh, ministerial uh, capacity. Um, I vividly remember that um, during um, these years when I was in the parliament, usually European polit um, uh, politicians regarded Rail Baltica as, um, uh, as an option, uh, as a chance, uh, the, the chance which which uh, Baltic countries can can sort of invest in and and, and can, can 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 contribute to to this to this option to to build this uh, this um, uh, high speed uh, rail network, um, but I believe that um, uh, if not after 2014, after the illegal uh, annexation of Crimea, then definitely uh, uh, after uh, February 24th. Um, uh, Baltic governments and, to be honest, also the, the, the Commission and, 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 and maybe even EU taxpayers need to regard Rail Baltic uh, not as an option, but basically as an obligation uh, to, to complete uh, because of, as um, uh, Mr. Eeps rightly pointed a couple of minutes ago, because of the security, because of the uh, military mobility, because of the defense um, security. Unfortunately, we are now sitting, you know, in, in the first seat, and um, uh, we are uh, unfortunately watching uh, how crucial, how important are uh, the transport uh, links uh, in order, you know, to save to save your your uh, your country, um, and therefore this uh, I be besides many. Uh, quite important and sort of classical um, uh, approaches that usually are, are regarded towards uh, uh, a railway. Uh, I think that this is the, the time is ripe to, to, to understand for all of us that this project definitely needs to be uh, regarded as a strategic, uh, not only geopolitical uh, project, but strategic uh, project in terms of uh, security defense. Uh, not only, you know, transporting heavy military or, 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 or military personnel, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a military expert by any stretch of the imagination, but, but even I can understand how important um, it is. And it is also important for these kinds of projects as Rail Baltic, which maybe aren't necessary, necessarily uh, the ones that can um, uh, say that we, uh, the, the ones that, that, that can uh, compete uh, with, for instance, um, uh, um, uh, projects in Western Europe, uh, where countries, uh, societies are more wealthier, the business can be made, you know, bigger, larger. Um, for, for these kinds of projects, we still, we, we really need to look at it as a geopolitical and, a, and in, in, in this case as a strategic uh, object. Um, and um, I also think that this is, this is not that easy. I mean, it's easier said than done because um, uh, I suppose for Rail Baltica, in order to, to, to communicate this approach, um, uh, we were just talking about airplanes. And you all know how it is hard for us to be invested, to invest our um, 
uh, our, 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 our eyes and ears when uh, uh, aircraft personnel is trying to uh, tell us where the security measures are you know, hidden in, in the plane. Usually we are looking for a, a life vest when, when uh, on, on a boat when, when, when some kind of tragedy uh, arises. Um, uh, and therefore, it is, it, I, I fully understand that this is quite complicated uh, to sell this idea that uh, potentially Rail Baltica is very, very enormously uh, important. And if you want to be really bummed out, you know, just <laughs> um, uh, take a look at the um, uh, Google Maps uh, and then and, and take a look at the Suvalki Corridor. I think it's 60 miles long or something like that, uh, the border that uh, divides um, uh, not divides, connects uh, Lithuania with <laughs> with Poland or or, to, to, or, or, or basically the, the Baltic countries with the rest of the EU, uh, and uh, therefore uh, I re I'm really looking at it uh, as as a strategic object, and this is the challenge for us to to sort of to to understand that uh, that uh, we need to also uh, envisage it uh, like that. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. So, uh, talking about the dual use aspects of uh, Rail Baltic, I think you brought up another uh, very. Yeah, and, and if, 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 if I sure. can um, uh, finalize my, 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 my short remark, um, in terms of military mobility, we also need to look at basically uh, now on the, on the NATO, and especially uh, regarding uh, Finland and, and Sweden, but particularly Finland that has ex expressed its willingness to, to uh, join the NATO, and, and many of us in Latvia hope that this formally um, happens as soon as possible. Um, Rail Baltica now can actually be seen as a, one of the backbones also for NATO enlargement because uh, Rail Baltica in its philo philosophy and also technically with, with multimodalities, as you mentioned, can, can uh, and will connect not only Tallinn to Warsaw and to Berlin, but basically also uh, Helsinki. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So um, we can, I think, uh, very much agree that uh, Rail Baltica will certainly uh, strengthen uh, the re resilience uh, of, of uh, the Baltic states uh, in case of uh, various crisis, potential crisis situations. And uh, I, I, I see we have uh, more questions in the audience. Actually, they are uh, flowing in so well. I'm not sure we will tackle all of them. But uh, talking about re resilience uh, in this context, um, there is a question about um, uh, cybersecurity of the railway. So, Arturs, maybe uh, we can jointly, or uh, anyone who feels uh, they can contribute in this uh, specific regard um, tackled this. So the question is, uh, wouldn't unifying critical infrastructure of multiple countries introduce possible single points of failure, uh, for example, against uh, cyber attacks? Um, this is an excellent question, uh, and we are aware of those risks. Of course, we are going digital. Yeah, to see that all the train control systems will be digital, there will be radio communication, again, it means digital. Um, I think there are many, many risks, of course. But also, uh, the industry is uh, working how to detect them uh, in proper way and uh, uh, in the way that uh, they are uh, minimized as much as possible. Uh, let me tell the example. Uh, we are uh, currently at, uh, I would say, at uh, uh, quite very beginning of designing uh, the, let's say, the train control system. Um, the ones who follow Rail Baltica would see that there is uh, soon a procurement uh, uh, to be launched uh, for development of the of the system. But what we have discussed is also we're having a redundancy, um, we, and we will implement. Uh, um, uh, three train control centers. Um, theoretically, uh, we would need just one. Uh, but again, uh, three would mean that we are much safer and that we can react on, uh, on different disturbances. Yeah? So there are uh, uh, many, uh, many, many examples of that. And uh, of course, uh, uh, some of them are, I would not like to tell you uh, in order not to disclose the ones, but uh, of course, we are uh, seriously concerned and we want uh, want to work and to minimize everything uh, to the, let's say, lowest risk uh, uh, exposure possible. 
Thank you, thank you, Arthur. Yes, uh, if I, I can add on here, I think it's always a question of balancing. There are certain risks, but uh, what do you do? You don't implement the project? So no, you, you look at how you minimize those risks. You have a cybersecurity strategy, a security strategy that uh, we are also in the process of uh, uh, developing, uh, so I think uh, so much um, in this regard. So maybe now we can uh, take those two questions I saw. Um, oh, we have uh, three, four. Um, so uh, the one who uh, stands up first. <laughs> hey. uh, thank you very much for your informative uh, presentation on uh, Rail Baltica. Uh, this is a topic in which I'm very interested. And uh, actually, as a last year student of a bachelor in engineering, I would like my dissertation to be in rail uh, transportation in the future. Um, therefore, my question is, which are the most important challenges that uh, Rail Baltica will have to address in order to succeed? Thank you very much. Thank you. As for mega project, we, we have uh, many of them. Uh, it is uh, very much uh, uh, about the integration of the new railway system into the transportation system. It's all about decision making and uh, 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 making decisions in the way uh, uh, to have really the performance system. Um, and uh, I can uh, assure it's not an easy task. Uh, I know uh, I have worked also on the cross-border projects, like between two countries, but uh, Rail Baltica is unique in that sense that we have multi-country environment, and this is a huge challenge. Uh, so uh, it, it, it is uh, also very much on our everyday lives, uh, so to look uh, for different understandings of the systems for different uh, cultures, and to bring uh, uh, um, all uh, all the views together in order uh, that we deliver the target we have. And I would say that this is the greatest challenge. Uh, from technical point of view, Rail Baltic is just an easy railway, I would tell. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I suggest that uh, we take um, some two more questions specifically on Rail Baltica, and then uh, we, we, uh, I would also like uh, to hear Sarah's views on, on, the, on the challenges uh, and, and solutions uh, that, that you see uh, for, for the railway sector. So please, yes. Thank you for the recognition. Uh, in Germany, our national rain railway uh, operator is halfly privatized and halfly owned by the government. And I, as far as I got from the presentation, this is also to some degree the case with Rail Baltica. And this has led, in Germany at least, to a vast difference in quality between the high-speed trains and the regional trains especially over their historic perspective. And how does Rail Baltica want to ensure that there's not a vast discrepancy between the quality of regional trains and high-speed trains? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. And uh, actually, uh, um, I can uh, tell here the stories hours and hours. But I will try to be very short uh, um, in this regards. First of all, uh, remember, Viola both said uh, there was Latvian presidency, and during this time, there was uh, 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 then also uh, um, uh, the conclusion of the fourth railway package. This brought uh, a much more competition on the railways. Uh, what does it mean for Rail Baltica? Uh, we are delivering now the infrastructure, and uh, we want that this uh, infrastructure is managed independently from the, let's say, train operators or the railway undertakings. Uh, so in other words, uh, we have again uh, uh, another uh, case across Europe where we want to, uh, to build a new infrastructure which is uh, uh, accessible by, uh, 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 by any railway undertaking, provided there are, of course, all the economic uh, preconditions uh, uh, fulfilled. In other words, it means that uh, uh, the uh, PKP Intercity or Deutsche Bahn or even SBB or Renfe uh, would be able to run on the Rail Baltica tracks. This is the technical interoperability, but also, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, legal set uh, making it uh, possible um, by proper track access charging policy, by proper uh, 
uh, network access uh, policy. Uh, so this is quite different from the situations uh, uh, across uh, many, uh, many countries, uh, uh, also in some se in certain sense also some, something unique. Uh, uh, from another hand, different service levels this is uh, where uh, we have a little bit issue as we are dealing with the infrastructure and we are uh, preparing for infrastructure management. We assume the market uh, will play here the role and actually the, this is up to the railway undertakings, uh, the service providers to define the service. What we can do again, and this is uh, on the government level, and here the ambition would be to make a cross-border passenger service obligation so that the services for the regional traffic, uh, uh, we make in the same standard across the Baltics, so perhaps also Poland. There is way to go. We are just starting this uh, um, uh, this uh, work stream, and uh, uh, um, once we are setting these uh, standards for PSO, it means that we are aiming also having uh, one standard. Of course, there will be a difference between the high speed and the regional. But again, if you look on the presentation, what is our ambition, that there will be not that much difference. Um, so uh, uh, in the future, we have to find uh, then uh, really the balance, what the market can do, what is the market experiences, and what the railway undertakings want, and uh, uh, what we uh, want uh, then to impose uh, uh, again, from the governmental side, because uh, the regional traffic, the commuter traffic, typically in Europe is uh, also uh, um, subsidized uh, by public funding in order to get, uh, let's say, the time, speed, the price, uh, and comfort in the right balance. Thank you. Thank you, Artur. Uh, I can have a short remark. Sure. If you or someone else want to really dig into a uh, world of uh, rail, and rail services, you should check out the so-called fourth railway package, a bunch of regulations and directives, <laughs> that uh, package that is not measured by the number of pages, but by the weight of it in kilograms. And uh, there you will be able to find all the necessary information about the uh, facilitation of, of, uh, of uh, markets, facilitation of fair services, uh, etc. cetera. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks. And uh, yes, you mentioned the uh, weight and kilograms, so I think we have one, <laughs> one heavy weight question here, uh, specifically under Baltica, that we should still tackle. Uh, and uh, this uh, concerns the inflation. Uh, the inflation is on the rise, as we know, especially in the construction sector. Are you not anxious about going over the budget? And uh, after that, I would like that we focus really on the, on the financing issues uh, for, for kind of making um, the European goals become a reality? Oh, well, uh, uh, to be honest, we are. But again, uh, uh, I would say that uh, there are, uh, uh, let's say, two dim dimensions of that. Uh, 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 the inflation is something normal for the uh, economics and uh, uh, is ki kind of the driving force. What is important is uh, that uh, let's say the benefits and ultimately the costs uh, also including the inflation are uh, uh, are kept reasonable what i see currently in the current development in the baltics i would say that we can uh, be uh, quite uh, quite sure that uh, there is still uh, also uh, still a potential for maximizing the benefits uh, which ca can outweigh the inflation uh, of course they, they let's say um, the past month's experiences show tremendous uh, uh, issues with, with the logistics of construction uh, materials, notably steel. Uh, but now what are the, let's say, the, the first observations? It's all already, let's say, this, let's say this uh, kind of, I call it uh, uh, panic in the market is uh, going down. So uh, uh, I'm optimistic in that. Uh, way, but what is important always is to remember that, uh, let's say, the benefits and the costs uh, uh, shall stay in the balance. This is also the ba basic rule then uh, for the public projects that uh, with the public money we shall create uh, a benefits which are uh, much, much bigger than, uh, uh, than the costs we spend for that project. Thank you. So we have uh, so far, uh, if I can summarize briefly, we have had uh, 
uh, the financing challenges mentioned, uh, the, the keeping the transport networks resilient, uh, improving uh, the option for military mobility. Uh, we have talked about also the challenges of uh, making railways uh, more attractive to users. And um, here, uh, Sara, I would like to ask you the question, um, what ideas you maybe have uh, to add in this regard, especially uh, uh, you work very much with communications, uh, so maybe also there is uh, something we are doing wrong uh, when communicating to the passengers and, and the future users, and, and how, how can we best uh, attract people to rail? What would be your suggestions? Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to go back to the question that was asked in the audience, where uh, someone asked, why would someone take the train instead of flying? And uh, one of the answers is, of course, there's Wi-Fi in trains. So um, that is very helpful. You don't have that in planes. And um, I think that's really one of the key elements to make it more attractive for users. Have uh, reliable Wi-Fi, have... Um, in Germany, that's often not the case. I can speak from experience. Um, then also uh, expand night uh, trains, make it uh, more, uh, yeah, uh, more relaxing for people to actually yeah, go overnight, I don't know, from Brussels to uh, other places. And um, in terms of communications, I actually researched a bit, and many studies have shown, of course, that uh, inter, um, information and uh, communication technology um, can, in fact, incentivize uh, more sustainable travel and impact uh, consumer choices. And um, how do you do that? Um, by, uh, for example, car sharing, multimodal um, platforms, etc., they all rely on mobile applications. So making them work properly is one of the key focuses, I would say. And um, young people and the so-called Generation Z are all uh, digital natives, so really focusing on uh, making communication fit for the digital age would be my focus here. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so right now we will, um, I would like to invite uh, Walter Spapinch uh, to the stage. Um, he has been a participant of uh, the Discover EU uh, initiative and uh, we would uh, very much like to hear your story um, since you have uh, traveled by rail in Europe uh, to, uh, you can tell us how many countries exactly it was and uh, don't forget to uh, say how many trains had Wi-Fi on board, if you, <laughs> if you remember. So, please, your user Hi, experience. yeah, thanks. Um, whew, um, in total, we, me uh, and my friends, in total, we went to nine countries for in three weeks of time. We, from Latvia, <laughs> the uh, Rail Baltica isn't a thing yet, so we had to fly to Poland to uh, hit our first train. And we, uh, from Poland, we went through to Italy, through the Czech Republic and Austria, then from Italy to France, Monaco, Spain, Portugal, and in the end, uh, we had to go to Berlin. And uh, a lot of the high-speed trains were full, so we needed to find another route. And uh, we took a route through Belgium. So in the end, we got another country um, how we discovered the, e, the Discover EU? Oh, <laughs> this is us on our first uh, night train. It was a bit excruciating because sleeping there wasn't uh, pleasant, but the, the Wi-Fi, that was amazing. That really was amazing uh, because we could just sit on TikTok <laughs> as long as we wanted until we got, went to sleep. Um, me and my friends wanted to do something all together before hitting, uh, before going to university in the fall, because we were splitting up uh, our group, and we wanted to have our last moments together, <laughs> last moments together, um, even to remember this trip forever. We got uh, tattoos while we were in Barcelona, and uh, this picture actually has a really good story. I if I have time, I'd like to really tell it. Um, this picture is on the same train as this picture because uh, while we were sleeping, the train suddenly uh, thought uh, that it 
could uh, change course. And uh, from, we wanted to, to go to Vienna, but uh, we went to um, another city in Hungary, in, to Budapest. We went to Budapest. So, <laughs> yeah, as you can see, uh, the trains are a lot, uh, for you, I guess your, all your trains look this good, but uh, in Latvia, our trains don't look as good as uh, Mr. Iversiev mentioned before. Our trains come from the <laughs> Russian ascendants, so they look a bit more rusty and they're not as comfortable, and we don't have AC on them. We have open windows. Um, this is us in Barcelona, having our time of the life, have a feeling young, beautiful, and rich. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, us at our last stop in Porto. Um, it was the most amazing city I've ever been to because uh, the nightlife, uh, all, all the young people, just amazing. And um, I really recommend for you all to go to uh, to, uh, for you all to take uh, participation in the Discovery EU because it's mostly free. You get a free train ticket for, t you can travel 30 days for a whole, uh, whole month and you have seven travel days and that really is enough. Um, to take part in the initiative, you really, you just have to fill out a test. It's not hard. It, for me, it took like 10 minutes, I think. Uh, I think we won because we applied as a group. And uh, yeah, maybe there's some questions from the audience or something. Yeah. Please, one. I have a question about what you said when you ended up in Budapest instead of Vienna. How did you manage that? Oh, um, yeah, that was actually a horrible experience because it was our second day on the trip. And uh, two of my friends, they uh, fully jumped out of a moving train in the last seconds in a stop, uh, I think, in the Czech Republic. And uh, me and two, o my, two other my friends, we stayed on the train and jumped out at the next stop in Austria. And uh, that night, uh, we met up in Venice. So we were separate. Yep, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we were separated uh, for the whole day, and it was crazy. But uh, we managed. Oh, there's an, an amazing app called Interrail. And if you ever go on a Discovery EU trip, you will have to download the app. At first, it's difficult because it has a lot of information. But uh, in three days, you get used to it, and it's really Easy. Is there any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you for uh, your uh, characterization of Porto and for of, and Portugal. So it's very nice. <laughs> I also uh, like Portugal a lot too. And um, <laughs> but I'm biased. So. <laughs> uh, but my my question is, how was your experience uh, in terms of going? from Spain to Portugal, because we don't have high speed rail and uh, connections. Well, in the north to Porto, they are kind of better than in the south and in the center, but um, our interconnectivity is uh, not as good as in the center or, uh, or northern Europe. So yeah, yeah. that's the question. Um, um, we felt that uh, the Portugal train system isn't as good as the Spanish, but uh, we didn't care because uh, as we were in Spain, it was on the 9th and 10th July, and in that, uh, that was the weekend for the Madrid Pride. So every train from Spain to Porto was booked fully closed. And uh, we spent another night in um, Spain. And the next morning at 6 a.m., we got on a bus to Porto, and at, at 1 p.m., we were in Porto and we got to our first apartment, which was in the center of uh, the nightlife. In the, for, you should know, in the Galleria de Paris. There, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Walters. Uh, so I think uh, we, we are running already slightly behind schedule, so um, before we move on to the next discussion part, uh, we will um, have um, uh, another Slido question. 
Uh, so if you could, uh, um, sorry, not a slide or question, uh, you should, um, a slide or survey question. So please um, go again to slido.com. Uh, because we would like to see, apart from railways, uh, uh, what other transport modes uh, do you usually use? <laughs> so, <laughs> well done, well done, great engagement. Let's, uh, whilst, <laughs> whilst, let's, uh, whilst we get a slightly more uh, representative view, I hope, um, maybe I can uh, tell a little bit of my own short uh, travel story. Um, I wish Discover EU would have been around 15 years ago when I embarked on my own uh, journey across uh, Europe. Uh, so, um, at some point, I saw that uh, I, I love traveling and uh, it seemed I've done most uh, of Europe. So, out of interest, I saw which were the uh, EU countries that I still haven't visited and uh, I set myself a deadline uh, to, to get it accomplished. And uh, the four countries happened to be um, Romania, Bulgaria, Malta and Cyprus. And, um, and uh, now I wonder why, uh, what does that have in common? Uh, and uh, I, I realized that now thinking back uh, to when uh, I landed in uh, Cyprus on, on, again, a cheap Ryanair flight, uh, and uh, I was eager to get out. And uh, yeah, all of a sudden I had a Cypri Cypriot dancers welcoming me, mayor of Paf Paphos uh, handing me a glass of champagne. So it turned out uh, it was the first uh, Ryanair flight uh, so I think that maybe answers uh, why uh, I hadn't traveled uh, to those countries, uh, because uh, the connections uh, uh, were not so good. My ambition to travel was, uh, you know, just, just show me a cheap ticket, uh, I have a long weekend, uh, let's go. Um, so now um, we, um, we will move uh, on uh, to the next part. and. Uh, Apart from 20% uh, of aliens among us, it, sees, uh, it seems uh, we have also a lot of... Ah, no, no, okay. Here we go. Yeah, oh, 62, 62. Uh, we also use a lot of public transport, um, a lot of walking, uh, travel by private car, bus, and uh, we see that rail uh, comes um, uh, far uh, lower down in the list. Uh, also, bicycle, electric scooters, motorcycle, uh, very few people. people. Um, so, um, maybe um, now um, we can uh, go to the question of uh, what transport modes do you think uh, we should prioritize in the future? Um, I don't know, maybe who would like from the panelists uh, to address this first? Okay, natural rail. Of course, what we see here on the poll, this is also uh, uh, something representative. Also, I would believe in the poll results regarding the spacecraft. Perhaps it is just digital, but uh, 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 but still. Uh, so also the place of the rail, uh, uh, the uh, railways is uh, not a uh, number one, and this can be explained quite easily because uh, if. Uh, uh, on your daily basis, you let's say you walk, you commute to the nearest uh, destinations, and uh, uh, railway is used uh, more, let's say, for the longer commuting or long distance, uh, and aviation is typically then for the very long distance. Uh, so, in that sense, again, uh, I would say that uh, uh, it is important uh, uh, to uh, to develop a best mix out of all transport modes so that uh, each transport mode serves in the best way. And I see the railway is, uh, let's say, the connector and uh, the real link for the multimodality. Thank you. Since the mic was given to me, so thank you. No, 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 well, thank you very much. Well, um, first of all, the Green Deal is here to stay. Uh, this, even despite the current energy prices and even despite the fact uh, that, uh, well, there will be a lot of discussions about the future of, of many forms of energy like natural gas or nuclear, but nevertheless the Green Deal is here to stay. And since um, transport is one of the biggest positions in terms of production of CO2, uh, I'm 
I know what I'm talking about since my country, Latvia, we have, well, a rather, well, let's say, climate unfriendly transport sector in terms that a third of all the CO2 is produced by transport here in Latvia. We have a rather outdated uh, transport sector. And that means that basically, uh, of course, uh, all possible means of public transport, especially to make it attractive again, especially in some countries which have just recently started their industrial and post-industrial development, when uh, uh, having a private car, especially a big one, a C so SUV is really a, a, an issue of, of pride, an issue of one's self-esteem to have something like that. I mean, you look at the cars driving around here, for example, which means that we will have to change our attitudes towards the public transport, and that means that we will have to make public transport much more attractive and comfortable. Also, in terms of scheduling, this is what also the colleagues have been talking about. Of course, different kinds of car sharing and sharing economies, of course, future. And, of course, we are looking forward different kinds of, uh, uh, well, technological improvements, like different kinds of self-driving cars and so on and so forth, which are basically not so far away. We will experience them in the nearest future. And this is, of course, well, how do you introduce this multi-modality in that. But the issue is, of course, especially, well, we are mainly living in cities in Europe, and all the countries, including mine, is getting urbanized, which means that the cities are pulling people to themselves. Well, the big issue is how not to discriminate against those people who are still far away, living somewhere on the countryside. What the what kind of transport can we provide to them in order to get them mobile and to get them integrated into society? Because we all know that, well, especially with the current energy prices, prices of gas and so on and so forth, we are excluding certain groups from decent transportation because they just can't afford uh, having a ride to the city, for example. Uh, just because the uh, fuel prices are too high, and this affects the uh, underprivileged uh, parts of the population, and this is going to be a, a big challenge everywhere, just to make it short. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, very good that we brought up uh, this uh, issue of uh, accessibility of the transport infrastructure. So, I don't know, are there perhaps any... Um, accessibility issues that also young people are, are kind of uh, slightly uh, uh, not so privileged young people face and um, do we have any solutions how that could perhaps be tackled? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, um, if you come from a financially disadvantaged background, then you can not afford to travel frequently, especially if the tickets are not affordable. Uh, for example, that is why the uh, European Youth Parliament also supports um, via several projects. One is, for example, the Youth Dialogue for Strong Civic Spaces that is uh, supported by the Federal Foreign Office with um, travel grants for Eastern participants from Eastern Partnership countries, this year particular from Ukraine, um, to support um, these, um, these participants. And, um, yeah. No, I mean, also, I think that once, uh, I think the current number is still around 6 billion euros for the whole project. Once this kind of number is on the table, <laughs> I mean, we need to, we need to get on with the Rail Baltic and we, need to, and we need to finalize it. We need to finalize it as soon as possible. That's why I think that uh, as one of the prerogatives needs to be... Uh, usually there is the, the problem where, where all of the problems are very important and all of the issues are very important and you know, then you divide your attention to all of it. Uh, a lot of things are really, really important. I'm not sure about the spacecraft. I'm not sure about the carbon footprint on the spacecraft. But, but, but guys, rail is greener uh, than, uh, than, let's say, uh, trucks. Um, 
even if we are talking and and also, and also uh, let's uh, let's not forget about the safety, especially the road safety, especially for us, the youth and uh, us who are soon going to. Uh, uh, rise kids or, 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 or already are uh, rising kids. Every freight that we can put on rails, I mean the, 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 the road freight, that we can put on rail is potentially, it can potentially save, if not live, lives, then, 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 then health. And we need to, of course, take into account the, the um, uh, individual situations that we are uh, having in, in Baltic countries. For instance, we don't, um, it's especially in Latvia, we don't have um, uh, uh, roads, as, as Americans say, the interstates. Uh, we have small roads. Even the Via Baltica, uh, which is sort of the analog uh, to Rail Baltica, but just, 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 just roads that are uh, uh, linking uh, Tallinn, Riga, Vilnius, uh, Warsaw, etc. Uh, in, in, in most of the cases, there are uh, seldom cases where this main artery, transit artery, is more than one lane uh, per direction, uh, which means that every uh, truck that you are, that you need or you are sort of willing to take over, it's just, uh, it's just unnecessary uh, risk. And uh, the more trucks we can load on, on rail, uh, not only safer, but also uh, less pollution. Uh, uh, small villages, towns uh, through which usually these trucks go can feel much, uh, much safer and, and, and sounder. And also, uh, in Latvia, we don't use uh, paid uh, roads. I'm not sure about the new road in, in, in um, uh, uh, how, uh, how, the, uh, how it will uh, result, but gener generally we're not using uh, paid toll roads, which means that private uh, citizens are using the same roads, uh, and therefore uh, the alternative uh, in using a railroad is just, is just the best, I think. Thank you. So you actually, uh, you mentioned uh, trucks, and uh, in this regard, uh, the European Commission is also proposing now uh, to sort of um, increase uh, the dimensions that are permitted on, on European uh, roads uh, to, um, you know, to allow more goods to travel in one go. Uh, it, it can have... Um, uh, an impact uh, on the uh, reduction of the emissions, but uh, the railway sector is actually saying uh, that uh, this also has the potential to uh, drive away um, some um, kind of container uh, cargo uh, um, uh, clients uh, from uh, using rail instead, because uh, road transportation will again become cheaper. So I don't know, where do you see the balance? Maybe Mr. Iaps uh, or Arturs, uh, you would like to tackle this. Um, okay, I, I will try. This is uh, 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 not an easy question, uh, because this is all about uh, the uh, transport policy, but also the, uh, let's say, the behavior of the businesses and the behavior of the uh, cons consumers. Um, I think uh, uh, there, uh, again, the right uh, way is uh, uh, to, to, to balance. Um, we have uh, some, let's say, also some ambitions uh, uh, in Europe then to, towards the greener road transport, yeah? so greening. Like, and uh, here is uh, then again the challenge, uh, what will be the, let's say, the next uh, 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 m magic source of energy? Will it be the hydrogen or something else or just the batteries? But again, here is uh, uh, the, the answer perhaps is uh, in, into the uh, multimodality and uh, um, let's say uh, and uh, right, right, right combination. And the uh, right combination we can uh, get uh, only then when uh, uh, the, let's say, uh, the, the transport modes are also uh, in the, the, the same position. Uh, you, you may uh, have observed that actually the railway industry is not in the best competitive position because like compared to aviation, they have to pay VAT, uh, so it means that energy is uh, more expensive. Uh, they have to pay for use of infrastructure because any train running is paying for the infrastructure. Well, uh, uh, the, the fourth railway package brought also some changes uh, towards the truck access charging policy, uh, uh, but still uh, there, there is uh, 
uh, also different choices. If we uh, if we look uh, across the Europe, there are different uh, uh, policies. Uh, in one country, the tra truck access charges are very high, but for uh, for some tra uh, railway transport modes, they're outweighed again for the with the public service obligation or so on. Uh, uh, and there is quite a diversity, but uh, what is the common thing is that also, let's say, the road industry is uh, uh, placed much better in terms of uh, uh, of the pricing of the infrastructure use. Yeah. So in, in other words, uh, there is uh, still not enough, uh, 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 not not enough uh, uh, obligations uh, to contribute to, towards the development of the infrastructure. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we can explain why the freight on the roads is growing. Of course, another uh, 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 another challenge is uh, still the I would call it patchwork of the railways uh, across the Europe. We still have, uh, let's say, the national systems which are uh, 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 going closer, closer uh, to each other, but still these are. Uh, 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 separate railway systems. Like one of the ambitions is uh, the deployment of ERTMS across Europe. But what we can observe is that ERTMS is, uh, let's say, the best product, best in class product, uh, which is sold abroad. Yeah, the European invention and uh, any country except the European Union countries are applying ERTMS for their, their uh, modernization and, uh, uh, of the railways and uh, the new railways. And uh, we have uh, still a struggle uh, with uh, committing in Europe uh, for uh, uh, going away for the national signaling systems towards the ERTMS. Uh, to, let's say there are different uh, uh, different speeds of different quant countries. Yeah, but the common uh, thing is uh, that it will happen somewhere like 2030, 2040, or maybe later. Uh, so uh, th these are just uh, some uh, some examples. Uh, uh, why, uh, why uh, let's say, uh, there is uh, more uh, trucks on the roads that uh, there should be, and where there is less uh, uh, less uh, uh, freight uh, running as it uh, as it should be. So you see some solutions in in automation and uh, digitalization, and another uh, keyword you mentioned uh, before was also finding the right combination. So, Mr. Eabs, where do you see the right combination? Well, uh, first of all, as for the patchwork, uh, I think that this is really uh, an issue for you as young Europeans and future European decision makers. Because, well, uh, we sometimes think uh, and we sometimes hear a lot of talking about, well, Europe is getting too federalist, to, to whatever centralized, and so on and so forth. In fact, there are many spheres when a common European approach is badly needed, but it's, it is still not there, out of what we sometimes call in, in the European environment the European value added. There is this beautiful publication by, I think, by the Joint Research Center, which is uh, the, called The Cost of Non-Europe. If you haven't ever read it, just do that, because this is really, well, the value added which, well, would contribute to our lives, to our economies, if we, we would introduce a European approach to a certain problem. And this patchwork of railways is really a real problem. I mean, uh, Carlos uh, would probably agree with me that there is a strange tradition in the European Parliament to, to travel once a month to Strasbourg from, from Brussels. Well, uh, yeah, 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 without the proper Wi-Fi, but well, then never mind. Well, the idea is uh, that um, Strasbourg, as you probably, which is very interesting and very nice city, which is in France, which used to be German-speaking, the so-called Alsace, as a part which is close to the German border. But we, uh, most Latvian MAPs, when we go to Strasbourg, we usually go to Frankfurt, because Frankfurt is the biggest uh, air ha hub uh, in terms of uh, the biggest airport in, in, in Riga. From Riga, we have several flights to Frankfurt. But in order to get by train from Frankfurt to Strasbourg, you just can't do that. There is no such a train, because all trains in that direction stop at the German border, which means that in order to get there, you have to go from Strasbourg to from Frankfurt to Offenburg, which is the last stop of the German train, and then get into some 
car driven by a chauffeur from the parliament, and this is the only way you can get to your place of work. I, I mean, this very tradition of, of going to Strasbourg is, to my mind, uh, just a nonsense, I and mean, we just should just get rid of it. But nevertheless, we, we still do that. But nevertheless, this also shows the fragmentation of the network. And that's why my question, if I can ask the question to Mr. Stone, is about, the first of all, well, the Baltic cooperation in, in this particular project, which must be a pretty tough issue, as I can imagine. And the second is, of course, about the, uh, well, uh, should we say, the, the interest, the preliminary interest of the operators who might be willing to drive the trains on, on, on the rail Baltic. Thanks. Uh, on the Baltic cooperation, Thank you. This is yeah, indeed the toughest question uh, uh, of the today. It is also one of the questions we had online, uh, so um, let me find it. Um, okay, please, yes, uh, it was one of the questions, but uh, I can't locate it right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, in such projects, this is uh, uh, always, let's say, dilemma. Uh, 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 dilemma, do you want uh, to go the, for the highest target possible, but you have to have uh, the stakeholders on board, uh, or you go for the lowest common denominator. Uh, uh, what is uh, uh, our challenge is really to go for the higher targets, because we want, and this is also what we have uh, clear, uh, what we have heard also as a clear signal from the uh, the commission, like DG Move, we have to uh, go with uh, our project uh, beyond the current best practice. Yeah? So we have to uh, make a new best practice. Well, the first thing we have made already is, is that this is a unique project between uh, at least three countries, and this is unique in the Europe. Uh, but then agreeing on uh, uh, on uh, on the let's say common uh, financing, on the common uh, infrastructure management. Uh, these are all the things uh, uh, which, which are uh, on the agenda and are by far not, not, not an easy, uh, easy issue because there are different perspectives, different, as I told, uh, mentioned before, different cultures, and it's all about uh, 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 making uh, compromises. But uh, again, what is important is always to keep in mind that uh, if we want the performance railway, then we uh, we have uh, uh, to go for the best uh, best uh, mm, possible objectives, and it's by far not an easy way, of course. Uh, on the second question, the interest on the uh, railway undertakings in Rail Baltica, uh, we are about to start uh, uh, also some first preliminary consultations this year, uh, and. Uh, uh, um, there will be uh, the, the first, uh, uh, um, yeah, first surveys, both for the freight and logistics industries, but as well for the uh, railway undertakings. Uh, so far, we have uh, some preliminary interest, but we also want uh, uh, to make it uh, in, a, let's say, a formalized way, because this is kind, kind of early market consultation. And what we want is uh, also to, to have uh, 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 open access and opportunities for everyone, and this is why we are making the early market consultation, so that uh, we 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 see and we can uh, also embed uh, the uh, let's say uh, the views of of the uh, of the future clients, uh, because for the uh, railways, for the railway infrastructure managers, the the client will be the railway undertaking. Yeah, for the railway undertakings again the client will be the passenger or the uh, uh, or the uh, freight and logistics company or let's say then ultimately the uh, um, the owner of uh, of of the goods uh, in that sense uh, mm, uh, we uh, notice already the interest and this interest goes of course uh, uh, further than just uh, let's say uh, baltic interest uh, so we are optimistic here uh, uh, that uh, uh, we will have uh, um, uh, interest, but also we are looking uh, towards uh, uh, incentivizing, because uh, of course, Real Baltica is a greenfield, so it means that there is no uh, 
history uh, before uh, it is uh, not uh, an easy task uh, and uh, for a, a business uh, to assess properly the risks and uh, we believe that there will be also uh, uh, a need for some incentives uh, in the first years of the commercial operation of the railway line, yeah? both for the passengers and, uh, uh, and maybe also for the freight segments. And uh, this is uh, uh, also uh, something where we would uh, uh, look uh, also for, uh, let's say, innovation potential on, on the European level, uh, on, let's say, maybe even on the Parliament's level or, uh, or uh, in totality in the policy making. Um, we have discussed, I can uh, uh, tell just, just one example. Yeah? In the truck access charging policy, there is uh, a must that all the direct costs have to be covered by the railway undertaking. Uh, but what we are thinking, maybe, uh, especially in the first years, there would be something uh, better for uh, making uh, uh, a better competition, also in the passenger sector, to apply the negative truck access charges, so that we don't have to create basically a PSO monopoly, where uh, just one, uh, one company is operating a network, but having still a competition, but it is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, subsidized in some, uh, some transparent transparent way. Yeah? So uh, this is just an example and uh, we are uh, uh, as well, of course, uh, very far away uh, from uh, the very um, concrete solutions. This example, what I told, is not possible according to current legislation. Yeah? So I think there, there is also a need uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to think out of the box for the European transport system to really to uh, to go from the patchwork system to towards one integrated transport and, system. Yes, and uh, talking about actually incentivizing and tracks access charging, uh, one uh, other uh, European Commission's uh, proposal uh, is uh, that of um, exempting from VAT uh, the international train services. So that is already one uh, one proposal that uh, that is uh, in, on the discussion table uh, in the in the Parliament. And another one is um, uh, the proposal that all journeys uh, that are below 500 kilometers uh, uh, should be, um, uh, n not all journeys, but all kind of uh, group journeys. Um, uh, if, if you, for example, have a group of school children going somewhere under 500 kilometers, the travel should be done uh, by rail. So I would like uh, to ask, uh, first of all, Sarah, like, uh, do you think uh, this, this could be something reasonable or it would be a little bit uh, uh, too strict? Uh, and uh, Ivars, uh, how do you think that could uh, really be implemented in practice? Uh, um, I believe once the infrastructure is there to really support affordable, sustainable rail travel, uh, short haul flights um, should be limited um, significantly uh, per person. So you could do that by uh, giving out points um, to each citizen. That's quite radical, giving out points to each citizen of, of how much carbon emissions can you actually, like what kind of carbon footprint do you have? So. Um, you would have to limit your travel uh, choices in that regard. So, Ivar? Uh, well, um, first of all, this is always this comparison before, uh, between different uh, modes of transport. And first of all, as you might know, there is a strong tendency to uh, this privilege, if, if I may say so, the aviation, because aviation has been, just as was pointed out, very privileged uh, in many ways, because first of all, it was exempted from VAT and from excise, and then there is also was this, uh, well, the flight companies were allowed to buy their fuel in third countries where it is sometimes much more cheap than in the EU and so on and so forth, which made uh, the aviation privileged compared to other means of transport. And this uh, situation seems to be uh, bad in a sense that we all know that aviation, uh, since it is per definition uses fossil fuel because there are no, no electric planes and no hydrogen 
planes, apart from probably this uh, uh, space travel thing, uh, and which runs mainly on hydrogen, as we all know. But nevertheless, there are no no hydrogen planes to well uh, to, to 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 fly from 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 Riga to Brussels or whatever. Uh, well, uh, we all know that uh, aviation is much uh, worse for climate, and this tendency to abolish this privilege uh, is uh, part of the European Green Deal. Uh, it, uh, the uh, aviation is going to be uh, included in the emissions trading system. Uh, I myself was work. I, I, I was working on this. Um, there is a, another part of the Green Deal and Fit for 55 legislation, which is called the Energy Taxation Directive, uh, where Parliament has a rather limited role because taxes, unfortunately, are in the European Union decided only by the by the Council. But nevertheless, we had our own uh, version of of that legislation, and this was one of the tasks. For example. There is still a tendency to exclude fly, um, freight, uh, flight, uh, freight aviation from taxation. And then we uh, proposed an amendment which said that basically if uh, freight f flights are being excluded from taxation, then we should apply the same rule also to the trains, which are just uh, freight trains. And uh, this was a position adopted by the European Parliament. Let's see what's going to happen in the final version of that energy taxation directive. But, but the main reason is to, let's say, to make the playing field between aviation and rail more even. So this is the idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Actually, maybe uh, one more question for you uh, since... Um uh, we touched uh, on on uh, on the energy aspects, um, uh, and you are uh, working for the committee on transport research. Uh, sorry, uh, um, industry research and uh, energy. Uh, so one question we had on the Slido was. Um, uh, reads as follows, um, by moving the transport sector from fossil fuels to electricity, won't this put an excessive stress on the current electrical infrastructure, such as energy storing? Um, how, how, do you, how big do you see this problem? Yes, of course. Well, this is an, an, an argument that very often used also here in Latvia in our political debates. If all our cars were electrical, we wouldn't have so much electricity to run them. Uh, because, well, uh, of course, we, d we don't have such an, an, an electric uh, potential to, to... But, well, this is about, again, about having a gradual process. On the one hand, we introduce more electric mobility in many fields, especially in rail, as this, and in this case, and at the same time, and this is unfortunately the case, we will need more electricity. And this is what also our economists and our, 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 our people in uh, our uh, ministries dealing with energy is telling us all the time, yes, of course, we will get rid of fossil fuels probably uh, in a very gradual way, but we will. But at the same time, of course, we will need a lot more of energy. And this is what very much about... Uh, well, renewables, uh, which we haven't had a lot of during the last uh, 10 years, to say the least, uh, in this country, even co compared with uh, Lithuania and Estonia, and well, also about new sources of energy, like I know that this is a very contested issue, but nevertheless, this is nuclear. This is what we are still debating very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, Sarah. Yeah, I would like to add also it's about energy efficiency. So um, oh, you need to uh, reduce the energy um, demands. And how could we reduce uh, the energy <laughs> that we need? Because we still want to keep mobile. And I think this drive uh, to move more, to travel more, uh, to, to, to be more mobile, it's uh, not, going, uh, not going to go away by its own. Uh, uh, so unless there are some factors affecting that, like uh, the cost, 
Well, you know, we still don't know how the ETS will 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 be finalized on on on, on housing uh, heating, um, which of course in in, 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 in in one case would be regarded as a potential how to uh, use this excess energy in 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 in, in a different in a different way. But um, uh, I believe that there is also uh, slight risks in having these kinds of blanket approaches. That, uh, um, that, uh, that we are sometimes discussing. You just rightly mentioned uh, 500 kilometers on, on, on rail, or, or there's a talk uh, uh, for um, uh, some kind of uh, minimum uh, amount in kilometers for road uh, electri uh, electricity charging docks, uh, uh, be it 60 kilometers or 45 or 80 kilometers. You know, 500 kilometers in France isn't the same as 500 kilometers in Latvia. Uh, you would really need to make an effort to find two cities in Latvia that would be, uh, you know, 500 kilometers apart from each other, uh, one from each other. That's why um, I'm, 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 I'm usually quite skeptical when we are talking about these kinds of large uh, blanket approaches with, uh, with uh, stone-carved uh, kilometers, uh, etc. Okay. Um, so we have uh, 10 minutes uh, remaining in our discussion. I would like to encourage uh, all the viewers online and, and the participants here uh, to still um, engage actively and think of your last questions. We will still uh, carry on a little bit the discussion and uh, just uh, put your questions in Slido and we will take the ones f from the audience. Where I see so many uh, hands up, so maybe we, we start with that. Jump up. Who jumps first? Um, hello. Uh, if train is to replace air transport, wouldn't you agree that security controls we see in airports today would have to be done at train stations as well, making them less competitive? And like, how can the railway system tackle the problem of terrorism if we start to use it a lot more? Thank you. Uh, to, is there um, someone particular who, to whom you are addressing this question, or uh, anyone in the panel? Okay, I think uh, Sara, you are reaching for the microphone, please. Uh, mm. Um, I believe this is like a planning and logistics uh, challenge that again uh, can be addressed in Brussels right now. If you take it, um, the Eurostar to London, you are also being checked. Um, I've taken it many times. It was very quick and efficient. So I think this challenge is uh, easier to handle than other ones. For Rail Baltica, we can say uh, we are prepared for this, uh, for any situations in the future. Also, in uh, as uh, as example in the. Uh, uh, in the construction sites now in Riga Airport Station or uh, in uh, Riga Central Station, we will have the space uh, for installing the proper checks if necessary. Yeah? So uh, again, this is about uh, the sustainable design and planning. Yeah? For the moment, there is no need, but we have experienced, in my life, I have experienced uh, many changes uh, with the borders, no borders, uh, checks, no checks. Yeah? So over the lifetime of uh, a railway project, uh, uh, there, there are uh, many, uh, many, many, uh, let's say, things which will change. and. Uh, uh, what is uh, uh, what? What we can do is uh, our best to uh, to be uh, to, uh, ready uh, or to prepare the infrastructure, being ready for uh, different challenges. Yeah? And one is the security checks, yeah? but we don't apply the security checks for now, unless there is some uh, let's say some change in security situation. Thank you. So, please, more questions. Hi. Please, uh, sorry, just uh, don't be shy and uh, always uh, introduce uh, your name and uh, to whom you are addressing the question. So, uh, my name is Senator Erden. I'm from the Irish delegation and I'd like to um, address this question to Mr. Eeps. So, as a member of European Parliament, you, more than anyone else in this room, would have a proper gauge on what the political motivations are amongst Commission and amongst the European Parliament. So do you really believe that <coughs> the necessary political motivations and capital exists for <coughs> a proper addressal, politically and legally speaking, of the climate crisis in the field of transport, i.e. 
maybe the elimination totally of the need, economically speaking, for European citizens to travel by air due to the huge amount of carbon emissions we're seeing from airplanes to be replaced by maybe a supernatural or super uh, national, excuse me, um, system of trains operating throughout Europe. Thank you. Well, this is, this is really a, a central question. And, you know, well, uh, uh, this decision making in the European Union is very complex, and rightly so, because you have to uh, make uh, all those 27 uh, member states to work in, in very much the same direction. And in that sense, I would say that, of course, on if you look at the current composition of the European Commission and um, the European Parliament as well, there is very strong commitment to make uh, the things work. But at the same time, well, uh, what I'm uh, well, what, what we all are observing right now in Europe, especially well, we have an important, probably the closest, the really important uh, election for Europe is the uh, election in Italy, and the 25th, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, September, and we all know that well, uh, we have to balance all those goals of European Green Deal and 50, fit for 55 with uh, the expressions of interest and the expressions of uh, our citizens' will and readiness to get invested in this. So in that sense, well, it's always a compromise, but nevertheless, uh, what I am seeing right now uh, is uh, the move and commitment to the European Green Deal taking into account all the harsh realities of, 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 of the current Europe and current, current world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's continue with the questions. I think uh, we only have time for uh, two more questions, please. John? <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Uh, this question uh, is also, I'm, I'm addressing this question to Mr. Ivars once again. It's regarding uh, aviation. So as we all know, uh, aviation is one of the greatest conveniences uh, that we have in nowadays. And as numerous studies have shown, people like to put their own convenience before the well-being of others. So how would you, other than outright uh, making aviation illegal, would you compel people to concede this uh, great convenience. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, this, this is, I would say, a, a, a variation, a very appropriate variation of the uh, previous uh, uh, question. In a sense uh, that, uh, well, Europe has made certain experiences during the last years. And in that sense, of course, experiences like the Gilets Jaunes in, in France has been also very important in a sense that we see that environmental policies, uh, important as they are, have to be sometimes balanced uh, with, uh, well, uh, popular opinion, if you want. And in that sense, I'm really happy to see that our younger generation is much more committed uh, to green policies and to uh, European Green Deal in general than probably maybe earlier generations like myself. I'm, I'm 50 right now. Which means that, well, we'll experience also in those countries that have been rather reluctant to introduce green policies. Also, if you want a cultural change, then the importance of climate and the importance of, of uh, preserving our planet will raise. Uh, and this will be also reflected in the electoral outcomes of elections, which hasn't been always the case in many countries, uh, including mine. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will have one last question, and then we will have to conclude this uh, lively discussion. Please, the gentleman with the green uh, jumper. Uh, 
Uh, hello there. I am Andrew Leslie from the UK delegation. Um, uh, and I would just like to ask Steve Avars, actually. Um, so I'm from the UK, where our uh, transportation in, in regards to railways is bogged down consistently by uh, strikes for uh, strikes for rights for for workers. Uh, and I was just wanting to ask if there was any way we could incorporate a human element into this discussion, because obviously. Uh, the reason that in my country has has such problems is because we don't have uh, all, all the infrastructure people in place. And while we're thinking of the possibility of a railway, uh, a railway is not built solely out of metal and steel, but in, out of blood and flesh in regards to the peop people who actually work there, if that's okay. Well, uh, of course, well, we all know the, the context of Brexit, and uh, in that sense, of course, uh, well, uh, I, uh, I'm still a group where the British Lib Dems were a part, and we still really miss them. We all know that, well, th this was for a reason that, well, uh, the UK left uh, also because many things, like including the labor rights, uh, have been rather different uh, uh, between the EU and, and the UK. But nevertheless, uh, uh, well, I, my perception is that, uh, well, the UK will get back uh, sooner or later. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. So thank you very much. Um, although the discussion is so li lively, I think we could uh, extend it for another two hours. I hope there is no problem with our live streaming provider. Okay, just joking. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, conclude um, with one last uh, slide. Oh, Paul, okay, one very eager question, please. And then, uh, and then a slide of Paul, and then uh, in five minutes we wrap it up. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jadal Jadalov. So my question is that in this era of acceleration, when we are constantly experiencing innovation at a higher rate than ever before, do you believe that increased investment in spacecraft industry will be successful as an alternative way of transportation? Thank you. Sort of, uh, as, uh, thank you. I, I, I think we can, uh, I think we can refer. It's all about the belief, I think. Yeah. I think we can uh, refer back to the introduction of Commissioner uh, Bulch, where she wished us um, kind of fruitful uh, discussions on the wings of connectivity. So I think uh, this question uh, nicely rounds it up. Um, and uh, just as a last, um, please uh, go, yes, uh, to, to Slido. Uh, so uh, I would like everyone also from my panelists to just give me one keyword, one short keyword uh, that uh, you think uh, is uh, essential for making Europe's transport system smoother, more interoperable, cheaper, faster. What is essential? Multi-stakeholder collaboration between countries, businesses, sectors, people, civil society participation. Thank you. Uh, Carlos. That was a long keyword. <laughs> uh, I can only think of a keyword regarding Rail Baltic, if that's OK. Uh, my keyword is historical justice. Because, uh, I don't know, maybe I spaced out, maybe someone of you um, noticed it, uh, uh, talked about it, but uh, before the war, before the occupation, we sort of had our own rail Baltic. We had the European gauge uh, rail network uh, connecting uh, Riga, for instance, with, with Berlin. Uh, and now we, I think we deserve to have it back in a much more better uh, quality and, and expectations. That was definitely a shorter keyword. <laughs> Arthur. Historical justice, that's the keyword. Historical yeah. justice, excellent. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, do what you believe in and do it uh, with a high speed in order uh, that uh, everything gets greener uh, 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 as soon as it is possible. Thank you. And Mr. Iaps? Well, the keyword will be a slogan. We're stronger together. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> so.
So thank you very much for this discussion. Special thanks also to our viewers online and uh, for, uh, for the high activity uh, and engagement with questions. Uh, I, I'm sorry that we did not manage to answer all of them. Uh, so uh, if you drop them uh, in the Facebook uh, event comments, uh, we will definitely tackle them uh, in there. So um, right now, um, yes. Um, just to quickly summarize, uh, I, I think the takeaways, uh, one uh, I thought uh, we all agree on, uh, it's important, uh, the 10T network completion, uh, kind of having the network in place, uh, regarding the prior prioritization of the transport modes, uh, we have to look at uh, different incentives, uh, that, uh, and, and the policy making uh, to uh, sort of uh, promote uh, the, um, more environmentally friendly means of transport, but uh, that is one aspect. The other aspect is also making it uh, cheaper uh, for uh, also disadvantaged uh, groups, uh, improving the accessibility. Uh, we need to consider the financing, the balancing aspects uh, of uh, the costs and the benefits, and uh, look where we find the financing, because this is the, really the most essential, I think, uh, for... for, for uh, I, uh, I'm afraid nobody has uh, put it down here, but um, uh, yes, uh, it's uh, very uh, important, uh, as is Wi-Fi, and uh, uh, also uh, we noted about the resilience of infrastructure, which is also becoming a topic, uh, especially in the current context. So thank you once again, uh, the especially European Youth Parliament, uh, the delegates and the organizers of this discussion. So I wish everyone a nice evening, and uh, I would uh, invite uh, the organizers to uh, say a few words and, and the next steps for your event.